And Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Come on, sing. Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Jesus, I'll never forget how you walked me out. Come on, sing it. Jesus, I'll never forget. Oh, yeah. One more time. Jesus, I'll never, Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget. Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. God with a voice of triumph. So certainly give an honor to the, the most awesome mentor, teacher, preacher, pastor in the world. I've gotten to travel with him this week uh, as an armor bearer of sorts uh, as he uh, served at the wonderful prayer conference um, uh, uh, with Bishop White. And so it's just been awesome. And sometimes I go out with him, uh, you know, when he preaches and, and he's just a great leader, great teacher. He's poured into me on countless occasions. Can we, can we clap our hands and give God praise for Pastor M. David Van and certainly to my dear friend and sister, uh, Lady Diamond Van. And I want to shout out um, back home, my Bishop Hardy and, and Bishop General, certainly to my family, uh, and of course to this dynamic ministerial staff here. Amen. Did you bring your Bibles today? All right, let's get right into it. I don't got too much to say, so I'm going to take my time with it. Is that all right? <laughs> well, that's, see, that's the good thing about short messages. You can really take your time. All right, now I'm not going to make it a long message, but I will take my time if you will allow me to do so. We're in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter number four, uh, verses 14 through 16. We've got a little bit of reading today because then we'll go to chapter number five, verses 12 through 14, and then we'll end with that favorite of ours, Hebrews 12, one and two. And this is what it says. Uh, so starting with chapter four, verses 14 through 16, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. 15 says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. 16 says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, then we, that rather we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. This is the New King James Version, by the way. All right, let's go down now to Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. Here begins the reading of God's word. 12 says, for though by now, by this time rather, you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracle of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. 13 says, for everyone who partakes uh, only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid foods, solid, somebody say solid food. Solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who, by reason of use, have their sense extra have their sense senses rather exercised to discern both good and evil. And last but not least, Hebrews twelve one. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Join me in prayer. Jesus, we love you. Father, we love you. Hallelujah. Father, we love you. Father, we thank you. Father, we lift up your name. Father, we, we magnify you. Father, we glorify you. We are here to give you praise. God, won't you uh, feed us with that bread of heaven, God? Give us uh, knowledge, oh God. Bring, 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 bring us uh, new revelation in Jesus' name. Let now the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Father, 
Father, as you always do, grant me clarity of thought and precision of expression. Even now, we speak salvation and healing and deliverance and victory and healing again in the name of Jesus. Somebody shout Jesus. We pray in a faith-filled church set. Amen. You may have your seats in the wonderful presence of the Lord. In the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And so, church, I think I'm going to get a little comfortable today. Is that all right? <laughs> it, uh, I, I may just not bring the house down. <laughs> I may not bring the house down, but I promise you we're going to get into this word. Hebrews is where we are today, and when I originally learned that I would be speaking uh, this morning, uh, I, I was given that new series uh, entitled Iron Sharpens Iron. Am I right, Pastor? Uh, and, and this, of course, is found in Proverbs chapter number 27, verse 17, where it says, um, where it says, as iron sharpens iron, one person sharpens another. And, and now, if I'm being honest, you guys will all hear what happened, right? When, when Pastor let me know that I was up again, I was like, what? <laughs> you know, what am I going to speak about? But then right after, when he gave that, that theme, it, I was like, yep, Hebrews. Because that's what God has been dealing with, uh, how God's been dealing with me in, in a recent season of life. And so this was something that was special to me. It was something of a confirmation. And I'm telling you all this just to say that uh, it's a good thing to have an anointed leader who not only hears from God, huh, but listens to God, who not only listens to God, but obeys God and responds the first time. So can we clap our hands one more time for our leader this morning? It's a good thing. Somebody say it's a good thing to have a leader anointed as such. And so uh, that very theme uh, to me had begun to, to make it more apparent uh, how we need one another. We need one another, Right? Whether we like to admit it or not, we need our brothers and sisters in Christ. That being said, I think it's a good thing also for us to take an occasional break from talking about how we're going to deal with our haters, okay, and instead discuss how we're going to collaborate with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lean over to somebody and say, uh, hey, somebody, I need you. <laughs> say, somebody needs you. And it just might be me. Hallelujah. And so... Given this theme, I found myself once again in the book of Hebrews for a long period of time in my study, and I arrived at today's topic. I think some people might enjoy the topic is get your head in the game. Somebody say get your head in the game. And real quick, I'm going to shout out uh, our sister Faith Welch and brother Noah Welch, who just starred in high school musical at their school. Let's clap it up for them. I'm a youth minister at heart. And I love to celebrate our uh, youth in the church. And so if you don't know that uh, familiar phrase in pop culture, it comes from this hit film from, believe it or not, 20 years ago. Right? I know. Uh, from 20 years ago called High School Musical. And, and the song, believe it or not, is about basketball. Right? It's about basketball. And uh, I had a conversation about a week or two ago with Pastor Van and, and, and Deacon Brown and and. <laughs> He, was, he asked us, why do you, why do you love basketball? What, what is it about basketball? And I remember Deacon Brown gave such a great, he didn't know I was going to share this in today's <laughs> message, but he gave such a great answer. He said what gets him is that basketball is a team sport, and it requires for the players to work together. No matter what, we can't do it without all five of us, right? So thank you, Deacon Brown, for that. And so this morning, can I suggest to you that discipleship is also a team sport, Amen. We need one another. You need somebody and somebody needs you. And so real quick, because I'm a teacher at heart, for some brief history of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews is one of the epistles uh, written by an unknown author uh, to the Jewish Christian audience uh, or the Messianic Christian audience. That's what we call it now uh, through uh, by who many of us believe is Paul. Uh, it's to emphasize the superiority of Christ over the old covenant. There is no longer need that is uh, for repeated sacrifices because Jesus is the one and only sacrifice. Uh, but I wanted to look at Hebrews today because I took interest in this idea that Hebrews is not written to a church that's new to this, but rather it's written to a church that's true to this. 
Am I talking right? These are, this is for the seasoned saints. It's it not, not about age. It's about these people know the culture. They know the traditions. Amen. Uh, uh, actually, Hebrews is, is seen as one of the most complex um, um, epistles to read because of how much prior knowledge it requires of the Old Testament and, and all the culture and everything about the Old Testament. But in spite of this complexity, I was particularly, I particularly appreciated uh, that Hebrews was all about people, Christians, becoming spiritual grown-ups, all right? It's, it's time for us to be grown-ups is, is essentially what, what this writer is saying. And so to get the overall message behind Hebrews, you actually could look at that verse that we started with, uh, 12, 1 and 2, where it says, let us run with perseverance, the race marked before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. This translation says, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. But in today's text, we find the writer presenting Christ as our high priest, right? Now, the, the reason this is so important is because in Jewish, uh, in, in this Jewish Christian believer culture, uh, this, this letter is addressing priesthood, and, and priesthood had a very specific place in this culture. Uh, a, a priest in the Hebrew tradition had multiple responsibilities related to what we call sacrifices uh, because of Jesus, once again, there's no longer the need for the sacrifice, uh, the sacrifices as usual in that time. In fact, what we believe under the new covenant is that we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. We're a sacrifice that is living, holy and acceptable unto God, as Paul urges us in Romans 12.1. In other words, you know, Jesus died for us, we live for him. I'm sure you've heard that before. Amen? And so, uh, the, the Jewish traditions, in the Jewish traditions, we have this intricate uh, uh, practices of the priesthood. So the writer in this letter it has to be specific about how Jesus' sacrifice supersedes the prophets. It supersedes Moses. It supersedes even the priesthood itself because he's the high priest. And so the text says, once again, seeing that we have a great high, a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. The scripture says that we're going to have to hold firmly to what we believe. It, it, we, it, there's going to be some things that occur that's going to cause us to realize we, we got to hold on to this belief. It's not just something that we can, uh, you know, kind of have in the back. It's not something that we recite as, as pastors. It's not just something we recite every day. This belief, this, it's not just, it, it's more than that. We have to hold firmly. Why? Because we have access, if we think about it, we have direct access, essentially, to this great high priest. Amen? So, so what this letter is first addressing to me is the privilege of we the saints. We are a privileged group of people. Sometimes I don't feel like I'm privileged, but then I got to think about the access I have to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords. That's a privilege. We are a privileged group of people. Hallelujah. And so the letter goes on in verse 15. It says, for we do not have a high priest. I love this part because it also addresses our human the humanity of our faith, right? It goes on in, in 15. It says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted. That settles it for me. In all points he was tempted as we are yet without sin. That's the thing that's different for, for him and us, right? So Jesus came down and was tempted just like we are today. The only difference is he didn't sin. I love that part of the scripture because if you ever feel like no one knows how it feels uh, to have these temptations, you can remind mind yourself, no, 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 no. We have a great high priest, but also that high priest understands us. He understands the humanity of us. He's fully God and fully man and fully understands what it is to be a human. And so that's, so, that's something that we have. So with that understanding of uh, what Christ has done, what are we to do? Well, in verse 16, it says, let us therefore come how boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Look at somebody and say, grace is the thing I need in my time of need. Grace is the thing I need to do God's will. Amen. What are you saying, Brother Slack? I'm so glad you asked. I wanted to take today as an opportunity to direct us back to our agenda. I talk about agendas a lot because I, I'm a teacher and I sit in a lot of meetings and you ever sit in a meeting and you didn't talk for 45, 50 minutes and you, 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 don't, you didn't really get anything done on the agenda? 
it's like, that, that really bothers me, <laughs> okay? It's like we had an agenda, and we started on point number one, and we never made our way back to the agenda. So let me get back to my agenda while we're, while we're talking. I wanted to remind us that we have an agenda. We call it the kingdom agenda. And it seems that everybody is so bold about their agenda. When are the saints going to get back to being bold about our agenda? Amen? So we have an agenda. Our agenda as the church is to glorify God, advance his kingdom by glorifying God, to bring people to Christ, to disciple them in the faith, to lift up the name of Jesus. These are the old principles that used to make the church the church that used to separate us from the world. We were known by our agenda. People knew that when we came to them, we wanted something. We, we, we had something in our mind that we were doing. We got to look like a people with an agenda. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And <laughs> I want to let y'all know, uh, I, th today was a good day for it not to work because you don't got to worry about that with me. I don't uh, hardly <laughs> ever get to the V3. So you're, you're good today. This is a perfect Sunday for that to happen. God knew. <laughs> so we have an agenda. And, and another thing I like to say is that we are in critical times. Critical times. Critical times. I talked about this last time I was here. The very idea of holiness is being questioned throughout the world. But this is the thing. You expect it in the streets, but I'm coming into church circles and realizing some ideas of holiness is being questioned. And I'm like, What's going on? Right? You expect that. And that's why we have to hold fast to our confession of our faith, to the full confession of our faith, to the full understanding of what our faith means. Faith changes how I am, what I do, what I say, who I'm around. Come on, somebody. Thank you, Jesus. So we've reached a point where our faith is the only thing that will get us through. And as the scripture says in chapter 12, that uh, when we open up, it talks about that cloud of witnesses. The, the uh, you know, they, they come, you know, after, you know, the writer. He's, he's reminding us that the living saints, you know, have to persevere, right? Persevere. We got to think of all of the saints that have gone before us, like Abel and Enoch and Noah and Jacob and Abraham and Sarah and Moses and, and even Esther, all those people who had come before us. And I started to think about the importance of all of those people and all those stories, because in the chapter before, uh, that's, that's what he was talking about. He was talking about all those people and, and, and what had occurred with them and, and how they become our cloud of witnesses. So these people's faith having been recorded was such a big deal. I, I just thought about the importance of, of, of having this be documented because, again, we need one another. These people's story, stories were important. So I, I, the thought came to me, could it be, could it be that the things that we go through, the things that we endure is bigger than just us? I'm so glad that Abraham realized that it was bigger than him, that Moses realized that it was bigger than just him. It wasn't just about him getting into the promised land. He actually never got in. It was bigger than him. We have to realize that. So you see, we have so many wrong examples in the world. We have plenty of those, right? So why not, why not look to these exemplars, that is, look to these perfect examples to carry us on and carry us through a, a, in this race? And so in the second passage to, uh, of the day, it says, now this is the part I wanted to talk about, <laughs> okay? Verse 12, Hebrews 5, verse 12 says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers. Though by this time you ought to be teachers. Right? I, I, I like that, who I believe is Paul, just threw that in there. He's like, well, you know, <laughs> you're not even really supposed to need milk anymore, <laughs> okay? So he said, by this side, look at somebody and say, we need teachers. We need intercessors. We, we need some, so, this is a team sport. We need each other, right? Come on, so look at someone and say, get your head in the game. Okay, so he says, he says, you need someone to teach. He said, but you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracle of God. And he says, and, and you have come to need milk and not solid foods. Uh, and then he says in verse 13, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. So don't get offended by me. That's what he said. He said, you know, you're unskilled in the word of righteousness for he is a babe. 
Uh, but solid food, somebody say solid foods again. Solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is those who, by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so what I'm saying is that it just might be time for us to, to stop eating, to stop with the baby food, right? Uh, it's, it's time for us to start imparting to others, to start encouraging others, but also in order for us to do that, we, we can't be still eating, we can't still be drinking milk if we're expected to feed others. Am I talking right? We cannot do that. We cannot do that if we're still, we still need baby milk. It's time to chew. Look at somebody and say, it's time to chew. We know how to chew now. We know the basics. Now we got to move on to, to, to more. And so there is this, this um, infatuation <laughs> uh, with us, including myself. As I preach, I preach to myself. My dad says that all the time. As I preach, I preach to myself. We get stuck in the, we get stuck in the baby spaces. And then even when we've surpassed the, the, the baby, the spiritual baby phase, we, we try to go back to it. <laughs> especially when things go wrong. Especially uh, we, we say, okay, I want to go back to the milk. And, and the reason why I, I, I'm a... I'm a Bible teacher, and I always say I'm the Steph Curry of Bible teachers because I always have three points. So I have a lot of three-pointers, uh, and I'm great at them. Um, <laughs> so there are three things that make us want to stay in that baby phase of our faith. One, <laughs> and this is something my mother would say all the time, we think we're grown, okay? We think we're grown. We think we're grown. Any so we're in the baby phase thinking that we're not. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard some of the young people. I'm sure you heard your parents say, you think you've grown, right? And, and that's not good. If you, if you think that you've already moved on, to, but you actually are still doing things that, that aren't, aren't so spiritually mature, that's an issue. Yeah. Number two, we don't want people in our business. <laughs> There's a cost. <laughs> There's a cost when you, when you mature, when you press on toward maturity, as, as the scripture also says. When you, when you leave those childish things, there's a cost too, and, and it's, it's more public. We don't want people in our business. Number three, and this is the most common reason, we like the safety of childhood, right? We like it literally, but also spiritually. We love the safety of being a spiritual child. We love how there's so many people coming to aid us, but eventually... We, we're not going to make it off of the things that a, a baby Christian needs. So get this. We might even have to grow out of the idea that everything's always going to go our way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I know thing, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are the call according to the purpose. But that in no way, that doesn't in any way mean that things are always going to go our way. It says it's going to work together. Whatever happens, it's going to work together for our good. As we love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Salvation is not the key to an easy life on earth. I'm going to say that again. Salvation is not the key to an easy life on earth. It's a, it's a key to eternal life, but not an easy life on earth. We have to, we, a lot of what we got to do is put our pride aside in order to accept that, right? And, and the truth of the matter is God is, is not fixing to make room for your pride. Your pride, you're going to have to deal with it. All right? He's not going to open up to your pride. You're going to have to deal with it. Look at somebody and say, deal with it. Deal with, it. Deal with that pride. It's not, it's, God is not changing. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so it's you who needs to allow him to change you. Amen? So, so look at some, get your head in the game. Sometimes in life, things can go left. But even when we're in obedience, I always like to think about Abraham, okay? Because Abraham, he had some moments of disobedience, but then even when he finally was in obedience, he still had a, a really, really difficult challenge. Amen? Abraham was ordered to sacrifice his only son. And this is when he, when he was doing what he was supposed to do, right? When Abraham had this most difficult place, this most difficult turmoil that is recorded in Scripture, he was where he was supposed to be. He was Mount Moriah about to sacrifice his son. And the part I like about it is because of his obedience, because of his extreme spiritual maturity. That's extreme spiritual maturity, what he was doing. Just in the nick of time, a lamb came. Hold on. I, I hope we understand what this means. A lamb came to take the place of Isaac. 
just, now we know that's just a metaphor. We know what God was doing there, right? I, listen, extreme obedience is what Jesus did for us on the cross. It takes extreme obedience. That's when he works. I've seen, I've seen it recorded in scripture so many times that when we got to that place of I don't care what it takes, if God said to do it, that is what I'm going to do. That's when the lamb came in right on time to take our place. We got to understand the fullness of the story. It's not just that the lamb came and we were, no, it's that when we finally decided to submit to his will, submit to what he said, that's when he was like, here I go. I feel like, I feel like God likes saying, I told you so. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I'm almost done. Now, of course, we realize, like I said, the lamb that, that was a metaphor. For me, that's a metaphor, right? As I continue reading, thank you, Jesus. I came to encourage just a few people today in this church that, one, it's time to grow up. Two, we need each other. We help each other grow. Community helps us to grow. That's the idea of a college, a collective of people, a school, a collective of, of young people to help each other grow, to develop socially, right? We also need a collective of people to develop spiritually. Iron sharpens iron. Amen? So you, it's, for young people, it, it, it kind of worries me because I, I found it. Actually, I'll tell this. I had my students from the other church connect with the, the students this past Monday uh, from this church because they're in the same age group. And I know what it is especially today to feel lonely as a Christian in the hallways of the school because I see it. I see it in my classroom every day. It's like iron sharpens iron, right? But it, you need iron to sharpen iron. So, for example, uh, I think they use, what, sandpaper to dull iron, right? To dull metal, if you will, right? So if, if the iron is hanging out <laughs> with the sandpaper, the opposite of what's supposed to be happening is happening. Right? Are you guys get what I'm saying? So when, when we, the iron, the saints, uh, we're supposed to be sharpening each other to make us better, to make us more sharp, to make us, you know, to get. But when we go and we hang out with the sandpaper, we think that we're sharpening them. But what's really happening is they're making us dull. Iron sharpens iron. We, someone, get your head in the game. Iron sharpens iron. So what I'm saying is it can, we can feel hopeless when we're in this world that is rejecting us. We, we read that we would be rejected. But if we just hang around the rejectors, if we, if we, if we don't study to show ourselves approved <laughs> so that we can sharpen one another, we end up, we end up around, the, we end up not with iron. Okay? Iron sharpens iron, but it's got to be iron. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. What am I saying? I'm saying it's our turn. I, I, you know, like I said, I grew up in this great church, the Church of God in Christ. I know we had some wonderful, 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 wonderful saints who came before us. I remember them. I remember those people who prayed for us. I remember even as a kid being prayed for and healed instantly. That's like maybe not something that everyone can talk about, but I, I had that experience, and so I know how easy it is to think, you know, well, that was mother so-and-so who had that. Pa no, no, it's our turn. We are the prayer warriors. We are the intercessors. We need each other. We, we don't need, listen, we don't need to take people. No, no, sometimes God's saying, I need you to do that, right? I need you to sow into this person's life. I need you to be the solution. Hallelujah. I need you to say something with love, real love. It's our turn. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But then what happened? But when I became a man, I put away the childish things. Right? Right? It's time to put away the childish things. I was talking about the sandpaper and, and the iron. You know, I know that was a kind of a crazy connection. I'm glad y'all got it. But that's how those, you, you notice some crazy things starting to make its way into the church, right? When the saints are hanging out with sandpaper, that's what happens. <laughs> that's, what do you expect? That's how those insane ideas. But we, when we 
The saints are holding each other up when we are staying in our words so that we can hold each other. You Sometimes aren't we as a collective, we as a body can't afford for you to not be studying to show yourself approved. Sometimes we need you. Look at, look at someone and say, I need you. We need each other. So our private time spent in our word does act, it, it affects us, of course, right? But it also is about everyone around us. It's our turn. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Study to show yourself approved. And, you know, the reason, I love that that scripture says, because I, I looked at the translation of this. I, I, you know, I'm not great with all the Greek and Aramaic and stuff, but I, I wanted to make sure it said show yourself approved because, you know, we kind of frown on when people are just showing, but it actually is study to show yourself approved. You need to know what you're talking about. You need to, you need to pray for revelation. You need to study and you also need to meditate. You need to spend time in this. Wo- we, we need that. Come here, Jude. What, what did you, Jude was talking about how we have to, sometimes we're going to have to defend the faith. There's going to be times when we have to defend the faith. Now, listen, I don't know where I am in these notes because I've talked about so many things this morning, <laughs> but it was all about this. Amen. So what I'm saying is it's time for us to come together. This is a team sport. We need every single part of the body. Amen. We need every single part of the body. Thank you, Jesus. And, and sometimes we got to remember when we have Jesus, we have everything we need. We have everything. No matter how bad it looks, when we have Jesus, we have everything we need. And therefore, we're on the winning team. We're on the team that's going to win anyway. They used to say the fight is fixed. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> so, when we have Jesus, we have what it takes, and I, I like to talk about this. Y'all are going to think it's silly, but I find it interesting that one of the foremost uh, nursery stories uh, that's usually told to children in the very early stages of childhood development is the story of the three little pigs. Uh, because, I, I, you know, like I said, I went to school for education, and I was in, infatuated with this idea that even at a young age, like little tiny children, my, my niece and nephew, they love this story. They're infatuated with the idea that sh- your house is, your, your place of res- refuge, it's got to be made up of the right stuff. <laughs> it can't just be made up of anything because you have to protect yourself against the adversary or what the kids call the ops, right? The opposition. So at an early age, we realize our house has to be built of the right stuff. And come here, Peter, because even when Jesus was, he used an illustration about our faith. He didn't say upon this uh, slab of wood. He didn't say upon any old, he said upon this, what? This rock I'm building my church. This rock of your faith I'm building my church that the gates of hell will not be able to fill it. We have to be made up of the right stuff. And, and where do we find the right stuff? We find it in our word. We, we, when we press on to maturity, because I'm telling you right now, the things that we go through are going to level up. The things that we go through level up, and that calls for a leveled up Christian. A leveled up, focused up Christian with their head in the game. And we, it also calls for brothers and sisters ready to support us. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Our faith is how we achieve and get through. And Jesus also said, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. He was talking to the seasoned saints. I've told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have troubles. But take heart. I have overcome the world. I know you look around and you see it getting worse and worse. And you're saying who even is standing up for God anymore? Who is even doing this anymore? But he's overcome it already. You, so, so, just the knowledge that God has already overcome it has to keep us strong and keep us going. The Bible says, I look to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. He's our present help. And sometimes the help that comes from the Lord is our brothers and sisters. I look to the hills from whence cometh my help. I say, Lord, I need your help. I turn around and there's Pastor Van. I turn around, there's Mother Liber. We look to the hills. Uh, The help is going to be there for us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say, help me, Lord. Lord. I know you, 
I know we, we go out and we hear all these things, and, 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 but we got to stay encouraged. We have to encourage ourselves sometimes. Hallelujah. And, and come here, Paul, because, yes, suffering. Paul said, but those sufferings are not worthy to be compared to the glory that we revealed to us in Romans 8, 18. He said, even, even though I know there's suffering, I know the glory is higher than the I know it's greater. It can't even be compared. It's so great that it can't even be compared. And so when we go back to that scripture, I love this. Because when we mature, we got to realize this too. That even when we slip up, even when we fall all the way down, he said, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace where we may obtain, oh, where we may find grace. And mercy in our time of need. So when I go to the throne, no matter how bad I look, no matter how beat up I am, no matter what, what happened before, when, no matter what caused me to come here, even though I'm supposed to just go, I, it does not matter. I know when I go to that throne, there's going to be some grace there. When I go to the throne, there's going to be mercy there. Hallelujah. There's going to be the things I need. That my help comes from the Lord. So he said, go and go boldly. That's what we got to do when we become hallelujah, spiritually mature. Press on, he said, toward maturity. Put, beside, put aside those childish ways. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We got access to his divine grace and mercy. Access through our high priest. Hallelujah. Whew. Church, we got to get in our words so that we can sharpen one another. We got to... Study to show ourselves approved. We got to defend the faith. Yes, we're going to have to. I love this part of Hebrews too. I didn't get to this today. It says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglect to meet together. That's when pastor said that today, as is the habit of some, but encourage one another. And all the more you see the day drawing near. Hallelujah. The day of the Lord, that is. It is. Uh, another thing, I believe this is Paul. He said it was good that I was afflicted. I don't know <laughs> where that came from. I just thought about that. It was actually good. Why? Because it was bigger than him. Because it's bigger than us. It's bigger than just me. It's bigger than just Jefferson Temple. Hallelujah. We are part of something bigger. Because this is a team sport. Somebody say team sport. So we, 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 we got to have our head in the game for this team sport because we want to be on the, we want to stay, that is, on the winning team. God bless you, and thank you so much. Jesus, I tell you what, God knows exactly what we need, when we need it, amen, thank God for you, Minister Slack, come on, let's give God praise for him.